So it's 1 p.m. Uh, in Kiel, 2 p.m. in Haifa, Israel. Uh, I would like to welcome the members of the Collaborative Research Center Origin and Function of Metaorganisms to our online seminar. It's a great pleasure to have a seminar speaker today from Haifa. We stay at the moment in these strange times in our tradition that we not only invite senior PIs from the community to our series of seminars, but also young investigators, I would call them the next generation uh, investigators. We had last time Silvia Moriano Guterres as a senior postdoc uh, as our seminar speaker. And today it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Assistant Professor Nama Giva Zatorski from Haifa, from the uh, Technion there. Before I would uh, like that uh, Nama gives the talk, I will briefly introduce her. Uh, Nama is a group leader, a principal investigator at the Technion in uh, Haifa. It's a wonderful city at the Mediterranean in uh, one of the, I think it's the third largest city of Israel. And uh, she is combining system biology, microbiology, immunology to get uh, deep insight into host microbe interactions. Nama got her training in um, Israel and uh, she studied, uh, she got her bachelor in Tel Aviv University. And then she moved for a PhD at the Weizmann Institute uh, with uh, Uri Alon. And then she did a postdoc in Harvard uh, with uh, Dennis Kasper and returned back and is now, as I said, a group leader in uh, the uh, Technion. She does very creative, uh, fantastic work. I uh, met her some time ago because she is a CIFAR Asrieli Global Fellow, one prestigious uh, award uh, which she has among many others. Uh, I, would, I could uh, go now through a list of she is recipient of the Alon Fellowship. She is a Humboldt, uh, um, Human Frontier Fellow, an EMBO Fellow. A John F. Kennedy. She won the John F. Kennedy Prize and many others. Today we have a very energetic junior, but already uh, a person f in front of us, which has already left some footprints in the host microbiome field. And it's a great pleasure, Nama, and an honor uh, to have you here. We do the Zoom meeting as normal. Nama will now upload her talk and uh, go through the talk. And after that, there is uh, plenty of room for questions. Please, uh, because we are so many now, uh, please use the chat function uh, so that we can go in order um, through the chats and then uh, I will readdress the questions to Nama. With that, uh, very, vel very welcome in the northern parts of Germany, Anama. It's as sunny as in Haifa, but very different, of course. And uh, we are all very much looking forward to your talk uh, on the uh, host microbe interactions. And I see that you have already changed the title of your talk, which is great. Welcome to Kiel. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wish I would be, it would have been uh, possible to be there physically. And I'm sure it will be possible in the near future. Um, so I'm really honored to be here today. And thank you so much for this invitation and so kind introduction. I'm also honored to be in CIFAR together with Thomas. And I'm learning a lot from Thomas. Um, and feel, feel free to ask questions. Uh, for me, it's fine also in the middle, whatever you guys. And also Thomas mentioned in the chat, totally uh, open. So uh, the, I will talk both on the post that my postdoc work that uh, was the basis of some of our uh, studies in lab and uh, about some studies in lab and uh, ongoing research and uh, future plans and happy to chat. So we are interested in the gut microbiota and the interactions with the host, which doesn't need a lot of introduction. Uh, we are very uh, interested in the communication between uh, the microbes, um, how they control each other, uh, and how do they complement host functions. We are very focused on uh, the microbial uh, functions. Uh, so we're more and more looking more at the functional uh, aspects of the microbes rather than their names even. Uh, this is really the latest um, that, that we're focusing on. So, and we're 
Yeah, and, and we know now that the microbiome has uh, many uh, features and um, relevant to many types of diseases. Um, in lab, we're mostly focused on colitis and uh, cancer. Uh, trying to, as much as possible, look at the mechanisms of these interactions. So, um, as Thomas mentioned in my PhD, I was in Aurea Lons lab, which was a systems biology lab. Um, Aurea is a physicist, and I came from chemistry and biology, and he taught me I was there actually for eight years, master's and PhD, and a couple of kids in between. Uh, so, uh, I learned from Ori uh, how to look at biology with a systems biology way of thinking in the sense of looking for design principles, for principles that can explain biological phenomena that we can um, reflect on other biological phenomena by this understanding. So when I joined uh, Dennis Casper's lab, or actually when I interviewed in his lab, uh, Dennis asked me, why did you come to my lab? I see that your PhD was on protein dynamics and cancer cells. How does that relate to the microbes? And I told him that um, first, and I would like to tell you as well that in first from my bachelor's, I fell in love with microbes. I thought these unicellular organisms with uh, so many functional properties and really like machineries in, uh, in one cell, and the, the ability of them to communicate really fascinated me. Uh, so I was always interested in uh, microbes. One actually um, important um, physiological mechanism that I studied during my master's was of, of uh, Marguerite McFall Knight that was also, is also in our CIFAR group. And, uh, and also the um, study of Bonnie Bassler on the same um, microbes in this organism, this um, Hawaiian squid that has an, an or organ of bacteria that communicate between each other and turn on their luminescent uh, light in order to be able to go out at night to um, look for its um, prey without being seen by, by their predators. I thought it's an amazing um, mechanism. Um, I'm sure, or I, I think you're aware of it, but also it's, M Margaret has amazing talks and also Bonnie Bassler. Uh, and I, I came to Dennis and told him I want to pursue this dream of mine to study the, these uh, microbes. And the gut microbiota is especially fascinating to me because it's, um, relates to host to human physiology. Back then, uh, Dennis studied uh, mainly Bacteroides fragilis, a human common gut bacteria. I'll mention it uh, in a few uh, slides. And um, he identified a specific um, polysaccharide of Bacteroides fragilis and its um, activity to induce anti-inflammatory responses in the host. And I told Dennis that coming from the systems biology way of thinking, I would like to take this as an amazing example and look at the whole microbiome as a system that complements uh, the host immune system. It, and now maybe it's uh, more uh, prevalent, uh, but that was 2010 when I interviewed. And uh, that's how we started this project in close collaboration with uh, Christoph Benoit and Diane Mathis, asking what are the immunomodulatory effects of human gut bacteria? Which gut bacteria are immunomodulatory and which um, arms of the immune system do they um, induce? So when we started, uh, Bacteria fragilis was known to induce a regulatory T cell response and IL-10 production anti-inflammatory. And SFB, uh, studied by Dan Littman and Ivo Ivanov uh, in New York, um, is a mouse microbe that was shown to induce a TH17 response. And that was all uh, that was known back then in 2010 and when we started 2011. So we were asking whether there are additional gut microbes that induce additional arms or, of the immune system, or are these the, mo the major arms of communication? And to do that, we uh, first analyzed the human microbiome uh, project, uh, 150 healthy humans. Uh, so this dendrogram shows the five major phyla in uh, the human gut. The different colors are the different phyla. And uh, we chose bacteria, the star red stars are the bacteria that we chose to study. So we were interested to encompass the diversity of the human gut uh, microbiome. And uh, we worked with germ-free mice. Actually, there was a debate. Should we do like a high throughput screen with one output 
and uh, study many more bacteria, but looking at very uh, one output in the immune uh, response and in vitro, or should we go for this uh, whole organism, uh, the germ-free mice, one microbe at a time, and looking at more uh, immunological uh, aspects. So we chose this uh, approach. Um, took about a year to build up the system and then about four years uh, working on this project together very closely with Essen Sefik from uh, Christophe and Diane's lab. Um, so she's a P she was a PhD student. So in this um, project, we colonized mice, germ-free mice, each time with my one microbe. So I, I believe you're aware that germ-free mice don't have any microbes in and on them and they're kept in isolators isolated from the environment. Uh, we colonized each time with one microbe and after two weeks, we looked at the host transcriptional response at the colonization patterns of the microbes and we focused a lot on the uh, immune response. We looked at 23 different uh, immune phenotypes in five different organs like um, systemic spleens and peripheral lymph nodes, mesenteric lymph nodes that drain the gut, the colon, the small intestine, and the pears, patches, the lymphoid organs on the small intestine. Um, actually, I'll mention that microbiology-wise, most of these microbes are gut microbes, and they really colonize the gut. Uh, some microbes are were oral microbes that can be found in the human gut. And interestingly, in germ-free mice, they prefer to colonize the oral cavity, and they, even though they didn't have any competition, they didn't uh, translocate uh, to the gut. Um, we did this for 64 different strains of uh, bacteria. So it was like a machine for isolators. Like one week you colonize this isolator, you harvest that isolator and so on and so forth. And um, it um, led to many 28,000, I think, uh, dead data points. So this is the snapshot of the immune response, a slowdown. <laughs> Um, so in this heat map, each column is a microbe. Uh, at the left, it's germ-free. At the right, SPF, a mouse that is fully colonized. And um, the, this uh, matrix is uh, showing a uh, fold change. So germ-free is white. Everything that is red is above germ-free. Blue is below. So induction or reduction of this uh, cell type. And each row is a different cell type. First half is colon and second half small intestine. And at the bottom, this uh, bar graph is uh, showing the cumulative response. So the gist of this uh, slide um, is that we see that the gut microbes, the human gut microbes, uh, have a variety of effects on the host immune system. Very few microbes were stealth that didn't induce any immune uh, response. and Many bacteria induced more than one phenotype, like we see here in the bar graph. And also we saw this uh, redundancy, which I really like because it shows that each of us can find uh, our own solution depending on our nutrition, our genetics. Not, it's not like one microbe that induces T-Rex and another that induces T17, uh, just mentioning the two cells that I talked earlier about. But uh, we can find many solutions here. And actually, we're working on it uh, right now. So there is kind of a redundancy. Many microbes can induce the same immune response. Many immune responses can be induced by many types of, uh, of um, microbes. And we're now analyzing it computationally to look for uh, minimal consortia that can induce the fully SPF-like immune uh, phenotype. Um, one aspect that we um, focused on was the regulatory T cells because they were shown before to be induced uh, by bacteria fragilis. But apart from bacteria fragilis, the thought that was that only mixtures of bacteria can induce T regs to the level of SPF. So the y axis here is the T reg uh, percentage, and the x is different uh, microbes one at a time. So we found that many microbes, even monocolonized, can induce Tregs even to the level of SPF. And this is true across phyla. So the colors here are different phyla. Even if we color this um, by genus, we will see the same mix. It's not one phyla that induces the Tregs, but many types of phyla. 
And we induced a TNBS colitis model to study whether these Tregs are functional. And we indeed found that when the Tregs uh, are highly induced by the microbe, by the individual microbe, the colitis score is low, an inverse correlation. So these Tregs are indeed protecting from TNBS colitis in mice. We also found in uh, human patients the relevant bacteria uh, when the colitis score was uh, lower. Um, we then, out of all this data and with the systems uh, approach, tried to see whether we can uh, correlate and what happens when we correlate between the different immune signatures. So uh, I tried to go slowly as well here. This is an illustration. Each bacteria has a score. Um, like upregulating or downregulating a specific immune cell. So each score here is up or downregulating a specific immune cell, and each bacteria has an immune signature. When we correlate between two bacteria, we get one number, which is a correlation index, correlation value. And this matrix shows the correlation between every pair of two bacteria. So for example, this pink tile, is close to zero. There is no correlation between this lactobacillus and this colincella. If uh, you see high red, it will be highly correlated, like obviously the, the um, diagonal, and uh, dark blue will be highly anti-correlated, so opposite from each other. So interestingly here, we find that bacteria that are very distant from each other phylogenetically wise, uh, so according to the, their genetics and their phylogenetic origin, they are very different, but they induce a very similar immune uh, response. So microbes from very distant phylogenetic um, origins uh, can induce a very similar immune response and also vice versa. Two bacteroides could be uncorrelated and even anti-correlated. Uh, so you can think it's uh, complicated, but also you can also take it the, the flip side, which is one fascinating to this, uh, this capabilities allow for many solutions uh, for a healthy gut microbiome. Um, so to summarize this part, we find that uh, we found that many types of individual microbes can induce many types of immune cells. I focused on the T-Rex, but we found many types of immune cells. Some are yet unknown, like this uh, delta negative T cells, no CD4, no CD8, but have a TCR. Um, and um, I think it's a wealth of uh, studies that can come out of, of, of this. Uh, in lab, we're interested uh, in the mechanisms of these interactions. So um, uh, what are the microbial derived immunomodulatory molecules and what are the mechanisms of this uh, immune activation? So for this first question, we, uh, we take two approaches. One is a genetic approach, um, knocking uh, genes and uh, transposing libraries. Actually, that is a little bit in a low uh, priority at this point in lab. And the other is a chemical approach where we um, chemically fractionate immunomodulatory microbes and in this, this time in vitro, understand um, which um, microbial fun fun fraction is functional. Um, so we start in vitro and then we go in vivo. And I think it's really interesting. Uh, we recently found that these fractions can affect the immune system, even in SPF mice. So even in a fully colonized mouse, if you add a bacterial immunomodulatory potent uh, fraction, it can um, induce a, an, an immune response in the mouse. So I think it's very relevant, of course, for humans that are not uh, germ-free, luckily. The second aspect is um, looking at the dynamics and the dance between the bacteria and the immune cells. And uh, to this end, we were interested to fluorescently label the, uh, the bacteria. And uh, I worked with uh, YFP and GFP a lot during my PhD, but never know during my PhD, I wasn't aware that uh, these um, proteins require oxygen to mature and fluoresce. And in the gut, our uh, microbes are mostly in an anaerobic uh, environment and anaerobes that, um, will, um, that don't like oxygen at all. <laughs> Uh, most of the, some of them die or 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 just like stop uh, their metabolic activity. 
uh, in when oxygen is around. So we were interested uh, to fluorescently label the, the gut bacteria. And uh, specifically, we focused first on this PSA, polysaccharide A, which was the molecule I mentioned at the beginning, and we'll mention again at the end, uh, the molecule that Dennis uh, Kaspert and Sarkis Masmanian in his lab and now in, in his own lab already, I guess, for over a decade, um, uh, characterized and studied. So it's an outer surface polysaccharide it's white or ionic uh, polysaccharide with a plus and a minus. And um, it, they showed that this polysaccharide is immunomodulatory. Uh, even when adding it alone, it can induce this IL-10 response. So in order to enable fluorescent labeling of these anaerobes, uh, we uh, adopted uh, a bioorthogonal metabolic labeling um, method that was uh, initially developed by Professor Bertozzi. Now it's in Stanford in which we feed the bacteria with a sugar that is connected to an azide. So it's bioorthogonal. This sugar with azide is not available in nature. We then uh, react the bacteria with the cyclooctine, which has this alkyne that be, since it's connected to these rings, it's very la labile for our chemical reaction. And this cyclooctine is uh, connected to an alexafluorophore that does not require oxygen to uh, fluoresce. The reaction is between this alkyne and the azide. No um, enzymatic addition or um, metal or anything is uh, needed to induce this reaction. It's very level, uh, very uh, active. It forms this um, stable um, tri trial um, ah. Triazole conjugate. I am blank the, the word triazole, and uh, it's it's fairly small, so it doesn't uh, interfere. Hopefully, and we tested on PSA, doesn't interfere with the biological reaction of the bacteria. Um, so this is how it works. We, in the case of polysaccharide A, it, polysaccharide A is composed of a repeating unit of a tetrasaccharide, four sugars. Uh, one of them is N-acetogalactose, I mean, and we added, we fed the bacteria with N-acetogalactose, I mean, with a, an azide. So instead of galnac, it's called galnaz. The bacteria, the bacteria dysfragilis uh, eats the galnaz and then incorporates it in the polysaccharide on the outer surface. Then this uh, cyclooctane reacts with the polysaccharide and turns them uh, fluorescent. And this is how it looks, uh, fluffy bacteria with the polysaccharides uh, labeled in the outer surface. And the pink is the propidium iodide um, DNA. And they look like donut-like shapes because the outer surface is uh, labeled. And we can, yeah, it's very efficient, 97% uh, efficiency and specific to PSA. We tested it on uh, mutants of Delta PSA and they weren't uh, labeled. It doesn't affect the growth rate. The fluorescent and non-fluorescent bacteria grow in the same uh, rate. And also it doesn't affect their immunomodulatory activity. So fluorescent and non-fluorescent PSA both induce uh, the anti-inflammatory IL-10. Uh, we first tested it in an um, IP model. So we injected the fluorescent bacteria to mice and uh, found them in the mediastinal lymph nodes that drain uh, the peritoneum. Uh, white here are the bacteria and you can Nicely see the B cell zones, the T cells around them, and macrophages. And zooming into the macrophages, we can visualize the fluorescent bacteria uh, in the macrophages and in this junction between the macrophages and the B cells. Thanks to a re reviewer, we uh, also visualize them in a live uh, mouse. So this is the same mouse alive. Um, a T equals zero, and then after the VAG oral administration of the fluorescent bacteria, we can put the mouse to sleep for 20 minutes and uh, insert into this uh, in vivo imaging system and visualize the fluorescence in the intestine. I know the resolution is not very high in, in this uh, setting, but it can tell us that the, bacteria, the fluorescent bacteria reach the gut, when do they reach the gut, and uh, when we take the um, counterpart mouse in the same uh, time points, we can study the dynamics of uh, the colonization. So it's, this is the stomach, the small intestine, the cecum and the colon. And uh, we uh, found that at 12 hours, 
uh, bacteria's fragilis is colonizing the, the colon, and we also um, uh, confirmed it with other uh, experimental methods. Uh, this one I love a lot because it's also a live mouse where for the first time we can visualize the live anaerobic microbes inside the, the mouse intestine. The blue here are the crypts and villi and the green are the fluorescent uh, bacteria just swimming around. Um, and yes, we're interested in their dynamic interactions with the immune cells. So uh, we applied this uh, method to many types of uh, bacteria from across phyla. Uh, here it's just a few, and in lab we also label now many types of microbes. We also now started to play with combinatorial labeling. So instead of labeling with six different colors, we label each bacteria with a couple of colors, and that enables us to differentiate between many more bacteria at once to study consortium of uh, 15 or more bacteria. Uh, hopefully next time I can show results on that. So back to this dendrogram, we identified which species of bacteria, or yes, we had here strains, but now I wanna dive into the strain level. So a uh, bacteria vulgatus induces uh, plasma DCs and Clostridium ramosum induces T-regs. But another question we had is whether um, different strains of the same bacteria. So I have a Bacteroides fragilis, you have a Bacteroides fragilis. Do they perform the same uh, function? Um, uh, so we had uh, in this study for several species, we have we had uh, several strains and now in lab we computationally analyzed uh, whether different strains of the same species induce an exact same response or a different response. and. Uh, guess what? They can uh, be different. So this is the same um, um, uh, heat map uh, showing, same type of heat map, showing different strains. So B, 2B dorii, 3B fragilis, uh, Biovatus, um, Enterococcus fecalis, three strains, and the immune cells they induce or reduce. Here we correlate between them. The more uh, important uh, slide that I would like to focus in is is this one, which is according to the correlation, we uh, clustered um, them according to their similarities. And you can see that um, many of the strains are very distant apart. So this pink is a Parabacteroides merdiae. It's, it's very far away from another Parabacteroides merdiae. And uh, this Bidoria is, is, is closer to this Biovatus, but further apart from another Bidoria. So we see that the strain um, matters and um, different strains of the same species can perform different uh, functions. And it's true both in the colon and in the systemic uh, response. And also it's different. You can see it's not the same cluster, not the same uh, clustering. So the, we cannot deduce from the colonic response to the systemic response. So now even further deep into their functionality, uh, we know that these uh, that the gut microbe live in such a dynamic environment, uh, changing by diurnal cycles and by nutrition. Um, they need to learn how to cope with their neighbors, their microbial neighbors, the, you name it. So uh, another question we had is whether one individual bacteria has the same function always in a population of a strain. So we talked about the phyla, there is phyla, genera, species. We saw that different species performed different functions, even if they come from um, the similar, the, the same phylogeny. And, and uh, we saw that different strains of the same species can be different. And now we're asking whether in the strain, is there a variability and what, what is the variability? How is it controlled? So, is each individual bacteria in a strain population different or similar, or only a few are different? And then when something, some danger is coming, maybe the most of the population will die, but the, these few will survive and save the whole population. But maybe this phenotype is, uh, genet is uh, energetically um, uh, difficult or costly for the bacteria and that's why usually it's a minority of the population. 
but kind of a bet hedging uh, strategy where one can save the community, like one for all and all for one. Um, so here uh, we focused on bacteroides because um, bacteroides are very common in humans and also they are known to have these inverted repeats. So in their genome, they have these um, repetitive um, sequences that can uh, homologously recombine and flip promoters from on to off or really arrange, rearrange genetic compartments in operons and, and, that, and that way can like, provide a phenotypic switch that can quickly change and then flip back just like this uh, bet hedging uh, illustration. So they have um, a large amount of inverted repeats, specifically also the gut bacteroidalis, much more than the oral bacteroidalis, uh, I believe because the gut is such a dynamic in environment. And these are really like uh, switches, like on and off switches that can flip. So in this study, we focused on a type one restriction modification system. The most important part here is the S, which is the specificity protein that recognizes the DNA sequences and determines where the methylation will, will occur or the restriction will occur. Um, so in Bacteroides fragilis, these are flanked by inverted repeats. I won't go into it because that will be like 10 more slides, but they are flanked by inverted repeats that which allows the, this, the same strain of bacteria to, um, to have eight different specificity proteins to switch between them. We don't know yet enough. Uh, we don't know yet uh, according to which environment, but we have some clues. So for example, in vitro, we find that um, this gray orientation is more frequent, but when the, the same strain of bacteria goes in vivo, it uh, changes, it's, uh, it flips around and uh, expresses this pink orientation much more. Uh, just for the interest of time, I, I won't go into the details of the, of the genetics, but I can uh, send you the paper. Um, interestingly, we found that this pink orientation induces a polysaccharide B. So we talked about polysaccharide A that uh, Dennis and Sarkis showed that it has anti-inflammatory um, uh, effects and it's more uh, prevalent. And we see that this, this uh, strain uh, in vivo switches around and expresses PSB much more. So I would say that B. fragilis has eight different polysaccharides and it can, and it, uh, can flip between them uh, and this system can control uh, and uh, cause an upregulation of this PSB in vivo. So uh, we found it in, uh, in RNA-seq and then confirmed it with flow cytometry and also with this um, immunofluorescent showing that in wild type population, only 9% express PSB and in the green orientation, only 1% uh, and in the pink orientation, 60% express uh, PSB. Yeah, you can see the punctuations because it's uh, on the on the surface, so PSA was shown to provide anti-inflammatory conditions. This is um, an inflamed gut, and when we add either PSA or B. fragilis expressing PSA, it, the inflammation is uh, reduced. And now we're asking, what is the function of PSB? Um, and our uh, our hypothesis or the study shows that when bacteria can switch its functions. We, we can even be, we should probably be careful uh, to even say that one bacteria has one function. It seems like they change according to the environment, according to their encounter with the host. And um, together with this fluorescent labeling and um, biogeography studies that we're performing right now, uh, we're uh, interested to understand the, the mechanisms, the conditions that allow these uh, switches and uh, focus mainly on, on microbial functionality. So these are projects in, in lab, and uh, we have the names of the students that uh, perform these uh, projects, which I'm very proud of. Um, yes, biogeography is, is a topic that Thomas and I are talking a lot about. It's, I, I think it's really interesting to look not only at the bulk uh, effects of the bacteria on the host, but also how are they organized, organized uh, spatially. And uh, I, I believe there is a lot of information in this uh, spatial organization. And this is the lab in uh, one of our uh, retreats. 
um, fundings. Yeah, I'm looking for postdocs if you're interested and really happy to take uh, questions. I hope it was okay with time. Thank you so much, uh, Nama. That was fantastic, uh, exciting, uh, very logic to follow from your how you got the idea and then you, where you are now. It's wonderful. Thank you so much.